Hey guys, welcome back to the Young Investors Podcast. Um, I don't know, to be honest, I don't even know. Is it episode 25 today, Hamish? I think it it's is 25. episode 25. It is. Jeez, I, I just launched into that intro before I even look at what number we're on. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's episode 25. We've hit the uh, the quarter of a century. How are you going, Hamish? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, Yeah, we're getting through them. Uh, we've got another 25, 25, 25, and then we can finally do our 100th episode. That's going to be a 100th big one. 100th episode special. Gosh, that's you guys, we've got some big, big plans, I tell you. <laughs> we've got no plans. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, in this podcast, again, we've got another guest, our third guest now, and I'm I'm really pumped to have our guest on today. So I hope you guys really enjoy um, us picking the brains of this investor that we've got on today. You guys all know him from YouTube. We've got Sven Carlin from the YouTube channel. Sven Carlin, how you going, mate? Thank you for having me. Feeling great. So let's do this. Yeah. How's things over in the Netherlands? Uh, flat. <laughs> flat and cold flat, and yeah. rainy. <laughs> flat. I like that. How are the markets? <laughs> flat. Well, I can tell you the markets are very flat in Australia as well. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. How's the weather over in the Netherlands? Rainy. It's pretty hot here at the moment. Yeah, here it's rainy. Winter is finally over, <laughs> but it's <laughs> shitty weather in the Netherlands. Oh, no. We have had the <laughs> longest summer in Melbourne. I don't know about in Canberra, but in Melbourne, we've had okay, the longest summer. Can we start summer. talking about investing because you are making me feel bad summers? <laughs> I think that's a fair, I think that's absolutely fair. No one likes to talk about miserable weather. <laughs> and no one likes to talk about long, hot summers when they're not in one themselves. <laughs> Thank you, guys. All right, guys. So you guys know the deal. Um, as, as per usual, we just go through the indices first up. Uh, we've got a couple of news stories to get through. And then, of course, the middle section of the podcast, we're going to be talking to Sven, all about Sven's uh, his background and especially his background in investment analysis and, and what he does with his YouTube channel. Um, and then also talking about portfolio structure a bit at the end. And then, of course, we've got a couple of Q&A questions. Hopefully, we've got time for them. We'll see how we go. Uh, so, Hamish, did you want to jump in and, and just run us through what the indices have been doing in the last week? Interesting week for the indices uh, this week. We had the Dow down 3.12%. Uh, we had the Nasdaq down 3.6%. The S&P 500 down 3.2%. And over in Australia, we had the All Ordinaries up 0.2% and the ASX 200 uh, up 0.18%. Mm, pretty flat. <laughs> pretty flat in Australia. Pretty flat here interesting, that, um, interesting that America came down a fair bit. Um, but I think that's to do with one of the news topics that we've got to discuss today. Um, so, yeah, I was wondering, so Sven, do you look at the indices much with your personal investment kind of analysis? Or is it something that you don't really factor in? I don't really care about the indices and what those do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I, I focus on the business and if I find a good business at a good price, I know that somewhere in the long term I will be rewarded. And if mm. it goes up and down, left or right, uh, flat or hilly, doesn't uh, change much for me. Yeah, I think that's quite in line with the way that um, that we go about our investing as well. So I think this should be a, I think we might see eye to eye on a lot of the topics that we talk about in the podcast because, yeah, I don't know, it doesn't really factor in much for me. Um, again, all about individual businesses. Would you say the same, Hamish? Yeah, yeah, it's something I really don't watch at all. Uh, like mm. Sven said, it's all about the individual business, what's happening uh, within the business and its industry. And over time, if you get that at the right price, and of course, we'll talk about our different strategies as we go through this podcast, then you will be rewarded over the long term. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, you said the, the, the uh, US market's down quite a bit. Did you want to jump into the first news story, uh, Brandon, yeah. and tell us why that might be? Yeah, well, I just I saw this the other day. One of the big headlines was that the Dow slides by 200 points as fears that the world economy might be slowing. But um, the, the actual reason, it wasn't to do with America. Stocks fell on Thursday after the European Central Bank uh, slashed its economic growth forecast for 2019 um, and actually announced a new round of stimulus <laughs> to help the banks uh, to help the banks out in the region. So obviously, people were just getting a bit concerned over the global economy. Um, the uh, European Central Bank president uh, said that the central bank cut its uh, growth estimate from uh, four, oh, sorry, for 2019 to 1.1%, which is down from 1.7% that they released uh, in December. So although it's not like a huge number, it, when you actually figure that as a percentage, it's quite a, a difference in terms of percentage. 
the European Central Bank, um, as part of this news story, they announced um, some new longer term refinancing operations like a, a stimulus program. Pretty much just loans provided by the ECB. Um, they kept at a low rate, so it essentially just makes it makes it easier for the banks to lend to consumers, which overall just helps stimulate the economy. But I, th- I thought what was interesting is that this is the third stimulus injection from the ECB since 2014. So fears that the world economy is slowing down. What do you reckon, Hamish? Do you, do you, do you care? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting that they've been doing stimulus, like three rounds of injections, and it's still very slow. And I feel like there's a lot of countries at the moment that are experiencing quite slow growth. Um, Australia is experiencing quite slow growth. Um, I mean, I care in the way that if there is some kind of world economic downturn, that there will be a lot of individual businesses that go on sale. Um, But to any other extent, uh, it it doesn't really worry me too much. Uh, Sven, do you look, do you know much about uh, the European sort of economy? Do you watch it? What do you think about unfortunately, it? I've, unfortunately, I know a lot about it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's very simple in Europe. Uh, people are getting older. They have no mm. kids. So you cannot expect growth. Mm. Right. Uh, secondly, just take an example of what we are doing now. I'm sitting in the Netherlands. You're sitting in Melbourne and Canberra, right? Yeah. And yep. what is the cost of what we are doing? Yeah, Zero. Like next to nothing. Yeah. Next to nothing. So you cannot have, you have quality of life growth, but you cannot have economic growth if the cost of the most things that we are doing, especially you millennial, millennials, is next <laughs> to nothing. Yeah. So, so people are simply focused on these numbers, growth, economic growth, but that's completely wrong because... Mm. Actually, we should be happy that there is less economic growth because we will spend less money. But we should focus, I think, for the next 100 years on improving the quality of life and not so much on what was the right thing to focus on in the last 100 years because the industrial era is over and politicians simply don't get that yet. Hopefully they will, but... (laughs) It's not less because Germany, for example, European Union, everything, they are printing so much money and stimulating the old economy instead of focusing and developing the new economy. And Mm. it's it's simply just kicking the can down the road. So, yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it, actually. I never really thought about it that way because you're right. A lot of the things that make life really simple for us are free like exactly what you're saying before like what we're doing here we don't have to pay a a huge amount just to access facebook or skype or something like that so i think that's a really good point that i guess i never really never really thought about is a lot of these things that make life what it is today they they kind of just um they're free for us we kind of take them for granted a little bit sometimes and when they are free they don't they are not included in the gdp growth Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's an interesting, um, interesting effect which I, I never really thought about on yeah on kind of how we live our lives today and all the convenient the free conveniences that we have, and that's that's relationship to lower economic growth. So I think that what you say about kind of an old old economy versus a new economy is is bang on the money. I think what you yeah especially what you said with like just kicking the can down the road it seems like that's definitely the case. And then as investors we have to see okay how are we going to invest given the trends mm. that are going on uh, mm. given what the politicians are doing and uh, really focusing on the businesses that will do well because it's always again yeah. go- coming back okay what bi- what will this business do is it perhaps a subscription service? Is it a podcast service? Is it something that will be used or some metal that will be used no matter what in electrical batteries or solar panels or something mm. that will be used no matter what happens to the economy? And therefore, news this week is about this, next week is about that, a few weeks ago it was about something else. And there is mm. always something to keep the media entertained to get to the clicks, to get to the views, but it doesn't really help your portfolio and your returns. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's a really interesting insight. Um, so, I, I mean, in Australia, we're, we've got an aging population as well, and uh, we've seen quite low growth just recently as well. Brandon, did you want to talk about what's happen- happening with Australia's economy? Uh, at the yeah, moment? yeah, sure. 
We might just... I did chuck this in because I know, obviously, all of you guys uh, listening to this are pretty much Australian, but we'll just fly through this because I really just want to talk to Sven more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, we've got our next news story is that Australia's economic... Uh, sorry, Australia's economy has just slid into a recession on a per capita basis. So, on a per capita basis, Australia's total GDP growth level has shrunk over two consecutive quarters. It shrank by 0.1% and 0.2% in the September and December quarters, respectively, according to the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So overall, the annual growth has fallen to just 2.3%, which is below the Reserve Bank's 2019 forecast of 3%. Yeah, what do you make of this, Hamish? Honestly, like, like as I said with the European stuff, it doesn't really affect me too much. I mean, I'm just focusing on individual businesses. I mean, it's interesting mm. to watch it unfold because... Uh, we're both very young, um, so I have. I mean, for me personally, what was I when the lo- we had the last recession? I would have been ten, <laughs> so yeah. uh, I had no idea what was going on. So it is. It's interesting as like a learning lesson to sort of go through this process, whether or not we're there yet or or not. But just to see these things happen and sort of see some of the cracks in the economy sort of appear, maybe. Um, I, I find it interesting to watch, but I don't really have anything particularly yeah. interesting to say about it. I think that, yeah, I think that this news story is really just a Australia-specific version of the first news story. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Really, it's just about slowing economic growth and people getting a bit worried. <laughs> but yeah, I think like but going back to what Sven, what you were talking about, it's just all about, you know, focusing on individual businesses and identifying not old trends, but identifying new trends and thinking to the future and uh, and thinking about your investment strategy going forward and, and not really relying too much on, oh, what was Australia's GDP and that sort of stuff. Shall we head into the new, next news story, gents? Yeah, so the last news story I've just got here was that uh, next week on March 14th, uh, Tesla will be unveiling their Model Y, which is their new uh, model... Uh, electric sedan, I believe it is a sedan. I believe I think it's uh, based. SUV. It's an SUV. Okay, but SUV. It's, but yeah, it's yeah. based off the Model Three. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. It's a. I think it's seventy five percent parts are the same with the Model Three. Okay, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. Uh, expected to start production of that in twenty twenty. Um, although I guess uh, Elon's notorious. What is it? Elon time. He's no- Elon time. He's notorious yeah. for delaying his initial production targets. Uh, yeah. So who knows if that's actually going to be accurate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are you reckon about this, Sven? Do you follow Tesla at all? Is Tesla uh, one of those companies that you like to keep on the radar, or, or not really? It's so much in the news that you have to follow it and you have to check it out. Yeah. And everybody's so crazy about it. But mm. uh, just a funny note: uh, Tesla, Nikola Tesla, the famous yep. electrician, was mm. born about a two hour ride where, from where I was born in Croatia. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So, That's so, awesome. So it's a nice connection to Tesla. And whenever you hear Tesla, 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 you know, oh, this guy was born so close to where yeah. I was born. And that's, awesome. uh, that's one. And on the company, uh, I think it's very simple. Elon Musk uh, has nothing to lose because yep. in the worst case scenario, the company goes bust. Yep. And he's really pushing on that growth, on those increased sales, on those improved margins, scalability and mm. everything. And as long as he has the money to play the game, as long as there is capital injections, uh, debt, uh, whatever the refinancing he's doing, he will do well. And the more stories, he's always selling those stories to get to the capital to fund the stories. And it's a self-reinforcing yeah. cycle. As long as it goes mm. well, what would crash, <laughs> what would kill Tesla would be a slowdown, a real recession, because then demand for cars and especially such cars that are usually leased from companies or something like yep. that, those drop 15, 20 percent. Plus, on the other mm. hand, the competition from others is increasing. So I would say, OK, Tesla, Elon Musk in this case is really betting, OK, I have a 20 percent chance of winning, I have a 50% chance of uh, keep it going without prof- profitability and I have a 30% yep. chance of going bust. So I better yeah. do whatever I can do to make this work. 
and I actually hope it will work because I like yeah. the electric vehicle trend, the renewables, uh, healthy mm. lifestyle and so. But it's simply a game of chances and uh, that's not what I like to invest. I like to invest with margins of safety, value investing. So I like to watch Tesla. I hope it succeeds. But let's say it's not my style, my kind of investment. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, I mean, you certainly have to assume massive amounts of growth. And I mean, like there's... Uh, I think it was Ron Barron is someone who's heavily invested in Tesla uh, and he was saying it could go to a trillion dollar market cap and you know he's explaining the maths of they could sell 10, th uh, 10 million cars and that's a that's a lot of cars like there's a big assumption yeah. you, you have to assume a lot of future cash flow in order to come to a reasonable uh, valuation for this company in order for the downside to be worth the upside. So 10 million cars, 10 million cars is what the largest producer in the world is selling, which is Volkswagen. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they have what 600,000 employees, uh, 25, wow. uh, I don't know, 40 factories around the world. Wow. And uh, cash flows, they are extremely cash flow positive. They, they yep. didn't even feel the 20 billion fine that they uh, received a, uh, a year ago and they have the capital mm. and they are investing more than Tesla is investing in the electrical trend. They will be launching new cars. So it's a highly competitive mm. uh, environment. And I'm seeing now I live in, a let's say, relatively one of the richest areas in the Netherlands. And a few years mm. ago, all the new electric cars were Tesla's. And mm, uh, right. the last six months, all the new electric cars are Jaguar I-Paces. Oh, oh, really? Oh, i okay. So just one car came as competition and I see no new Teslas, no new neighbors with Teslas, but I see a lot of new neighbors with the new <laughs> electric thing. So it's not really right. that Tesla has a mode. It had first mover advantage but that quit quickly erodes. It practically built a market for the others that are just ca coming in, which is unfortunately a bad thing for Tesla. Yeah, I saw um, Volkswagen, they unveiled an electric car, an all electric car just recently. Um, and I, I watched the unveiling for it and it looks really good. They partnered with Google for the all of the in-car tech um, and it, it, it looks really good. And it's interesting that you say that uh, the Jaguar cars are popping up because I think Google's also partnered with Jaguar for their, uh, for their Waymo car fleet. Uh, that they're testing at the moment. So, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, Elon has said in the past that moats don't matter. It's just all about innovation. Um, and, I mean, I'm not sure how true that is because there's only so long that you can stay ahead in, of innovation. You really do need some intrinsic characteristic in the business that gives you an advantage over other companies. And you don't... That didn't... That didn't exist over the last 100 years in the car industry and that will be the same over the la next 100 years. There is simply no mm. moat in the car industry. And yeah. Uh, yeah. as you said, the expected Model Y production start is in 2020, where everybody will come with 5 to 10 electric cars from Mercedes, mm. BMW, Audi, mm. uh, Chrysler, Hyundai, mm. na you name it. Everybody will yeah. come with 10, even Porsche is coming out with mm, yep. uh, brand new all electric. So it's simply highly competitive, which makes it risky from an investing perspective and which makes it very difficult to reach the 10 million cars sold yeah. to justify the valuation. Yeah, just too much competition. I do, yeah, overall, I do like the story of Tesla. I think you're right, Sven. I think that it will be a very testing time for Tesla if we do hit some sort of uh, major recession. I think that will be a, a tough time for them. Um, but I, I do think, well, I guess Elon, when he started the company, his goal was to just make Tesla try and advance the world's transition to sustainable energy. And I think if you, if you don't even look at Tesla from a business or investment perspective, I think he's really achieved what he set out to do. Absolutely. Because now you see, absolutely. yeah, now you, you're seeing that all these, mm. he's essentially his company, him, himself and his company is basically single-handedly forced all of these other car companies to start to think about and produce electric cars. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, definitely a recession might be a, a tough time for Tesla, but overall, in terms of the company, 
I think they're achieving what they were hoping they would achieve. Yeah. But and yeah, as you're saying, car, 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 the car industry, the auto industry, so competitive and just so hard to operate in. Yeah, I agree. I don't think there's any actually, real Tesla, models. Tesla would deserve to make it. They would deserve to be able yeah. to reach that target of 10 million cars in the next five years because of what mm. they did. But uh, mm, yeah. if you, you know, just deserving something because you did something exactly. good for humanity or the world <laughs> yeah. doesn't help much in business. That's unfortunately yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Business is business, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And if there is profit, everybody else will just chase the same profit you are chasing. Even if mm. you did so much good as uh, Tesla actually did. So I'll keep cheering for Tesla, but I will not invest my money in it. I think that's fair. <laughs> and that kind of rounds out the uh, the week of news. We had a couple of good news stories in there. Now we hit the middle of the podcast, of course. We've got our long section today. We've got Sven on the podcast. So we're going to have a really good chat um, about his YouTube channel and his background and also talk about his, his style of you know investment analysis and how he structures a portfolio and that sort of stuff. So... I guess, Sven, a lot of the viewers or the listeners wouldn't necessarily know yourself and, and know what you do and, and what your background is. So did you want to kind of give us a bit of a background of who you are, where you're from and kind of what your background is in, in finance and that sort of stuff? All right. So uh, let's start from the start. I started investing in 2002, which gives me wow. seven, 17 years of experience. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, so when I started, I always was, I don't know why, I immediately looked for companies uh, that have value, that have a good yield, some growth, and I did pretty well. And uh, then that was in 2002, I did really well up to 2007, and uh, then there was the recession, but I, did, I sold a lot of things prior to that. Uh, 2009, I wanted to dig deeper into the finances, investing. So I, after my master in uh, international economics, I uh, started a PhD where I really went into finance. And the topic of my PhD was uh, I developed a model for the analysis of uh, risk when it comes to investing in stocks, especially on emerging markets. So I have... Mm. When you do a PhD, you have to analyze everything else that other academics did and then develop yep. on that. So I have an academic investing finance risk analysis background. When I finished my PhD, I was teaching accounting, international financial accounting for three years at the um, University of, of Applied Sciences here in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. Right. So yeah. that's my academic background. And uh, nice. while doing the PhD, I was always teaching. So that's later it went into YouTube because I loved teaching. Uh, I was a high school teacher, so I always tried to explain things in a simple way. Uh, yeah. I also tried to work uh, to see how it looks like in corporate finance in uh, London. So I worked for a sh short, short period of time in, at Bloomberg in London. I was a data researcher. Wow. So How was that? It, so it was great, but you work 60 hours a week on yeah. what mm. Mr. Michael Blo Bloomberg wants. And yeah. the terminal was great. The uh, friends, uh, the contacts and everything you get was great. But I always wanted to develop something for myself. I wanted to have yeah. time to mm. learn more, to grow more. And uh, let's say London is like the car industry, extremely tough, extremely competitive. And uh, you just, if you get a raise, you get a better salary, you just want to move to a better neighborhood where the rents are uh, much, much higher. So nothing changes yeah. in your life. And so I <laughs> decided I resigned from Bloomberg uh, and got a job as a teacher in the Netherlands. But then teaching for three years, uh, you always teach always new people and uh, students as they are. They just care about uh, getting their gra grade, not that much about really yeah. learning something. Mm. So I, as you, you were a teacher, summers are off. I started uh, writing a little bit, started writing some articles, uh, analyzing stocks 
and uh, publishing on Seeking Alpha, published a lot of articles there. Then I got hired from an American company to write articles on a weekly basis and I liked it, liked it and liked it and I decided, okay, I have all these articles, I can do something with them. Yeah. So I started YouTube mm. uh, videos and uh, that got traction. So I resigned as a teacher, I resigned uh, writing articles and uh, wow. I just I started my own business where I do research on stocks and uh, that's what how I pass my weeks for now the last year. I'm a full-time mm, stock market researcher, so I just research, 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 publish my uh, reports, uh, manage two yeah. portfolios, and uh, just try to accumulate that knowledge when it comes to investing, because investing returns in the form of dividends, earnings also accumulate, but also investing knowledge, because the more I mm. research, the more it's easier to connect the dots. Oh, this happened. I remember five years ago, it was this and that. And uh, yeah. now that I can spend 40, 50 hours researching stocks a week, uh, everything is much, much easier. So uh, with the accounting background, with the academic background, with the behavioral finance background, that was also part of my PhD, let's say, I can now get to a good picture on what's going on in the markets. Yeah, wow. It sounds like you've uh, got a lot of experience in sort of the traditional side and sort of your own side, the behavioral side and that sort of thing. Uh, so full time right now, you're just doing your YouTube and you have your research platform. Yeah, you. I'm, I'm actually not that much of a YouTuber. I lowered it down to, I think, four videos, uh, five to ten minutes videos per week. So yep. I usually film, film those videos Friday morning from eight to ten. I prepare them uh, during the week when I have a little bit of time. So it practically YouTube takes perhaps five hours of my week and that's it. And the rest, the rest is all about uh, research. And then also that research goes into YouTube. So it's really just sharing mostly what I do and uh, that's it. So I'm not really focused on YouTube, which makes me lose a lot of subscribers, but I prefer to focus on the research. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair enough. And uh, and what's the, uh, can you tell us more about the research platform that you're working on as well? Uh, a year and a half ago, I asked my American employer, well, what are these articles bringing you? Uh, and he replied to me, oh, we have 120,000 subscribers on your oh, right. newsletter. And then I thought, oh my God, if I, I'm getting a monthly salary and I got 120,000 subscribers for this guy, then I said, okay, I can maybe not 120,000, but I can surely do the same for me. And um, I have seen all the articles that I have written in the past. They were always positively received by the people. People always wanted more. And so I have launched yeah. a paid platform. It's, I think it's now 349 US dollars per year. So what's that? Yep. $30 per month. And yep. everything yep. that I do, all my research, uh, I constantly, I analyze one sector per month. So I'm researching food stocks this month and I have a list of 100 food stocks and I go through each food stock, find the five stocks that I will dig in deeper. And on those stocks, I make really 20, 30 pages reports to really wow. understand the risk reward. And uh, that's what I offer to my subscribers. And uh, the feedback mm. is really positive for now. So I just keep doing what I do. Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of like the, uh, it's kind of like the ideal business because, uh, well, it would be for me at least. I'd, I'd find that really interesting yeah. because you get to run your business and you get to help people. But all of the research that you do, it, of course, it helps them, but it also helps you. I mean, you're doing the research for your own portfolio as well, I presume. Uh, that's, that, that's the focus. And the start of everything was actually uh, three, four years ago. Uh, I wanted to go to the normal route. So I was a professor, I was teaching and I opened a, an investment fund here in the Netherlands. So for oh, wow. three years, nice. I really had my own fund. I have the few clients. Wow. And uh, yeah. that was also one reason to do YouTube was, OK, I'm going to show my research, what I do, and then mm. maybe gather more uh, clients for the mm. fund. 
then yeah then uh, new regulation in the European Union, uh, the difficulty in scaling uh, globally because I could only get to Dutch professional investors. Uh, right. And oh, okay. then YouTube really got off, exploded, let's say. And then I said, yeah. okay, I can maybe change the business model. I don't have to do a fund. I can just sh show people what I do, all my research, and then they can pick whatever they do. And uh, let's say I went into a modern business model and uh, it's working much better than managing a fund. And uh, I don't know, I'm, for now, I will see whether I will start a fund in the next few years. But in yeah. the last few months, I declined about 30 million uh, US dollars in assets under management because oh, I'm now wow. focusing on the research and uh, not on managing uh, other people's money. Wow, so, that's unreal. Man, that's a really you've got a really great background. You've you've done a little bit of everything. But yeah, like I've followed your channel since probably you were probably under 5000 subscribers and that has grown unbelievably. So yeah, that's really awesome that you've been able to work on that and now work on your research platform as well. I think that's um yeah, li we're living the life. I think we've we've got it good. Um certainly a lot of fun being able to do, you know, what you enjoy for a living. And I really switched also to the, this modern business models, uh, subscription business models. And I have mm. closed my uh, Dutch fund uh, last mm. year because it was uh, simply, it's an old business model. It's difficult to scale. It's uh, a lot of costs, a lot of regulation and everything. And why when you can do it, as we spoke at the beginning of this podcast, you can do so much for free or for very yep. little money and you yep. can scale that globally and scaling scaling a fund globally costs uh, a lot of money so uh, when you can do it in a simple way helping people invest educating them in a financial way why not so uh, yeah i was to be honest very surprised by what can be done with this modern way of doing things but here we are we're doing youtube now talking to you on the podcast and it's exciting and uh, i'm just enjoying the process and we'll see where it leads yeah I, I i've always found that the the internet how it's created this sort of like infinite scalability and like like you said it's completely free i mean you do your research it's probably mostly free research on the internet i mean we can get access to all the annual reports you don't have to do anything uh the platform that you can run at, say a course on or a platform on could be free uh and youtube you can get your own marketing for free just by providing free content and getting viewers that way i mean the whole thing can be done at a very low cost and it's uh it's something that is just completely new to the business space. Yeah, I think people really forget about just how good we've got it. I mean, the internet it really opens up scalability. It really opens up the potential for anyone to do their own business. I mean, I was looking at some YouTube channel the other day. There's this like nine-year-old kid and his YouTube channel it gets millions of views and he just opens toys and plays with toys on the camera. <laughs> It's like, how's that? This this nine-year-old's getting like five million views for every for every video he makes. So he's le he's less than that. He's probably like three. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I agree, and I think that's that's really powerful. I think that's kind of what what we do with um, uh, going back to like online business. It's what we do with stocks as well. I mean, we I guess we chase growth. I mean, we're we're looking for growth, and the internet is such a fantastic way for. Uh, a, a fantastic business opportunity to try and get that scalability and get that growth. So I think that's... Um... Even when it comes to investing, I, uh, I think it was in December, I was contacted by a person. He has a trust fund mm. and uh, he has yep. a $13 million portfolio. And uh, he, wow. of course, he just got that inherited and he went yep. to, I will not name the bank, but to a large global investment bank. And they put 50% of it in US uh, medium term bonds, 22% right. in US stocks and 22% yep. uh, in international stocks. So for that, what they did, he's paying a 1% fee mm -hmm. yeah. on 13 yeah. million. So, and he could get the same by simply putting it in three different index funds where yeah. the fee would be 0.04%. Yeah. So that's 
one That's staggering one twentieth of what he is paying for the same service he could pay by simply doing and going away from that investment bank. So we are yeah. in a we are in for a lot of disruption. A lot of those old uh, school buildings uh, will have it tough because yeah. thanks to the internet and this again leads to less economic growth but leads to a better world and this is what people don't uh, comprehend yet everybody that wants to that has a lot like investment banks they want to hold to the old instead of transforming into the new you, and you see that around the world there's so many examples of just clinging on to the old and, and not embracing what's what's in the future well i guess this kind of that kind of transition transitions us quite nicely into um, starting to maybe talk about more your investing style and kind of what you what you look for in different companies. So are there any, I guess my first question would be, are there any kind of main areas that you focus on, particularly when you start to dig into a business and start to analyze it? Are there any kind of like key pillars to your approach or key areas that you look at with individual businesses? There is one simple key and that yep. is my belief and uh, that worked extremely well over the last 17 years. Business earnings are the key to your investment returns. Yep. So whenever I look at the company, I look at, okay, uh, what is the potential, the, what are the potential or what are the current earnings that the company is delivering or can deliver in the future? And then yep. I compare that to the price I have to pay for that now, to the risks, what can go wrong, what can go right. And then I usually I have a threshold that I want 15% uh, business returns for my investments, yep. which should translate into at least 15% returns per year. Mm. And now people say, okay, that's extremely high, but just look at Warren Buffett when he bought Coca-Cola he's now getting a 60% dividend yield on what he mm. paid. Yeah. It's unbelievable. That is unbelievable. So he paid $1 and he's now getting 60 cents per year on that dollar. Wow. Yeah. It really shows you the power of, of just leaving your investment, like picking, obviously finding really strong businesses, but also the power of holding for the long term. I mean, that is a staggering... <laughs> 60% dividend yield each year now is that's quite staggering so it's just the that's what I focus on I look at the more businesses as I can I look at businesses 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 and I just try to find those that okay if all goes wrong I don't lose my much money but if things mm. really develop well then I somewhere in the next 10 years i get to a dividend of i don't know 20 30 40 percent on my initial investment mm. yeah, yeah. Uh, where do you so where would you start looking like if there was someone who just had no idea what sector to start looking at would you pick a particular industry and then you would look through all of the main businesses in that industry or what is your approach to sort of starting to look at a new set of businesses say well, uh, let's say um, I look at the sector and then I really dig into the complete sector and I do pro probably a, a sector a month. So yep. uh, this, right. this month it was uh, food, uh, uh, last mo this month it is food stocks, last month it was uh, zinc miners, before that I looked at all the stocks in Russia. And I simply try to look, okay, I know Russia is the cheapest market in the world, so let's see what's there. Then uh, I read an article how zinc miners uh, are on average 50% down f in the last six months of 2018. Mm. Oh, let's look at that sector. Then food, yeah. food prices, I know that they are relatively low compared to what they have been yep. over the last 10 years. Therefore, lower earnings for food stocks. Okay, let's see if there is some businesses like that last summer was uh, brazilian stocks were very cheap uh, everybody was afraid about brazil going bankrupt or something like that but then i think okay can i find a business in brazil that will do well no matter what happens and i had some students from brazil i called them up uh, do you still watch television yes do you still turn <laughs> on the light and your airco 
uh, during the day and the light during the night. Yes, yes. Do you still drink your water? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and then uh, you can find the utility that's uh, giving you 6 7% dividend yield and you know that you can't lose. And the fact is that with all those index funds, they are simply selling everything related to Brazil. Uh, and of they sell everything related to Russia without looking at the individual businesses. And that's simply something that gives you an opportunity. As for your question, where to start? You can simply look around uh, what, where you're living, what's going on, what are people doing, uh, what are the trends that are growing. And then you can just write Google, I don't know, 5G stocks, and then you will get yep. a list of 25G stocks. And then you can slowly start looking at the fundamentals, at the book values, at the returns on capital, potential earnings, mm. etc. So uh, that's how I would start. So, yeah, okay. So you, so you start kind of, for you personally, I guess you start with what you do, you start kind of sector, sector by sector, and then from there you hone it in. For someone, maybe just a, a new investor, you might start out with kind of what you see around you, what you like or what you observe, and then try and dig deeper by kind of starting off with Googling and that sort of stuff. Once you get to that stage now where you've kind of, okay, so you're, you're analyzing food stocks and then you start to dig in deep onto a particular company. What are some of the, are there any, I guess, some key measures or key metrics or, or things that you like to see? Maybe it's like a, an economic moat or perhaps it's, you know, PE ratio or something. Are there any things that you specifically like to look for um, when you start digging in deeper with individual businesses? Uh, well, uh, I didn't mention it before, but I also wrote a book last year. It's called uh, oh, right. Modern Value Investing. And there I discussed 25 tools for analyzing stocks in a modern, let's say, value investing way. Right, so, right. So you look at 25 uh, even more factors that go from, okay, what the management said five years for, uh, ago and what really happened from mm -hmm. the balance sheet, from the tangible book value, intangible book values, impairment yeah. risks. So I really look at everything and then the key is, okay, what matters for this company? Uh, a month ago, before the stock crashed a lot, Kraft Heinz, I made a video and I said, okay, they really have a lot of intangibles mm. from their acquisitions and intangibles usually get impaired if uh, the acquisitions do not deliver on those expectations. And yep. unfortunately for Kraft Heinz shareholders, that happened later. But that is a risk. Okay, I'm looking at this company and you, you simply, depending on the business, okay, this is a risk for this company. This can happen, this can happen. So there is not really a strategy. Okay, you do the same approach mechanically on each company. Each company is different, like each person is different. And you always have to see, okay, what works for this company and what doesn't. Mm, yeah, yeah. You, you briefly mentioned management there, looking at what they said in the past and then seeing if they followed up on those promises, if what they said would happen actually happened. And that's something I actually do and I, I tell my audience to do as well because it's a good tell of whether or not the management is just constantly flip-flopping on what they say. I mean, sometimes you'll read a letter to the shareholders from five or 10 years ago and the, the CEO will say something and uh, five years later, they've just completely ignored it and they've moved on to something else that they're, they're chasing now. Um, is, is there anything else that you use in order to assess the management or do you just sort of read through what they're saying in the letters to the shareholders and then see if they follow up on those promises? Is there any other metrics that you use to sort of assess that? So uh, when it comes to the management, I really love uh, listening or reading the conference call transcripts. Yeah. Yep. So I just looked at the stock in the food sector and I read through the last six years of conference calls. Uh, wow. Because wow. You, you can really learn a lot, not from what the management is saying, but from what the analysts are asking. Mm. Yeah, because the analysts will ask usually if they are good analysts, you they will go to the key points that you have to know about the company, and then over the next quarter conference call, you see okay wh what the management did, and then you see okay how did that 
end up into the cash flows because at the end it all boils down to earnings and cash flows and uh, so you can get a feeling about okay is this management there what's the really the focus of the management is it improving shareholder value or is it just improving short term the stock market's uh, price so that they can sell their uh, options or telling a nice story because each CEO, when you listen to a CEO, you have to understand that he or she is a salesman. Yeah, yeah that's very true. They are, their, their job is to sell their own business so that the stock price goes up because that's what yeah. everybody wants. And that's their job. So they will do whatever it takes. And the better the salesman, the better the business will do. Elon Musk is a salesman. He is constantly <laughs> pushing new businesses, uh, new ideas, new cars, uh, hyperloops, uh, selling it to the investing community so that the stock price can go up so that he can get more cash in the form of financing, uh, better yeah. leverage ratios and so on. But yeah. you have to understand, okay, where does it where is the difference between a salesperson and someone that's really focused on returning value to shareholders increasing shareholder returns and that's the key differentiation for me is the management oriented towards me as a shareholder or towards something else i think that's yeah you have to have to dig deep on the management and have to understand where whether the, like Warren Buffett always says, I guess, whether the management team is, um, or whether, you know, the management is aligned with what the shareholders uh, are, are also hoping for and, and being a, what you say, Hamish, being a management team with both integrity and skill. But I think that the integrity thing is something that sometimes, um, yeah, is questionable in some management teams. Um, so I think overall, so I guess going back, so we kind of had a look at how, you, how you'd approach kind of starting to look at a business. I think a lot of what you're saying too comes back to the idea of kind of understanding the business that you're investing in and then looking at obviously the management. Um, do you try and look for companies when you're investing? Do you try and look for companies with economic moats, kind of classic Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger? Is that a big pillar for you? Uh, what I look is, yes, moats, but in the form, okay, what's the worst can, that can happen in the sector on, or in the industry? Right. And can the company yep. survive it? Yeah, right. Okay. And so yep. if the company can survive it, I know businesses, sectors, industries, countries, economies are cyclical. And then, okay, if they can survive the downturn, they will do extremely well in the upturn. Yeah, and, uh, on the up, yeah. Yeah, so I try to look for companies that can survive whatever the economy or throws at them. So that's, let's say, the minimum mode I uh, need to look at. Because if you have a business with a great mode, a great business, yeah. uh, great cash flows, it's usually fairly priced. Yeah, true. Yeah. You will get, uh, you will pay a price earnings ratio of 25, 30 or something like that. So as a value investor that aims to get higher returns that free, than 3, 4%, you have to look also at imperfect things, uh, but you try to, okay, you try to really assess, okay, what are the risks and what are the, what is the upside? So yeah. it's, it's a thin game, but the market is irrational. The market doesn't look at individual businesses. So if you really devote yourself to doing that, you can find uh, irrationally priced businesses. Yeah. And I think that comes back to, um, th this is probably the biggest thing that I take out of your videos, especially on, on YouTube, Sven. Um, and I guess it comes back to what you did with your study and that sort of thing is the, the thing I always like about your videos is that it's not, it's not a video where you're saying, you know, oh, look, Apple stock, this is a great company because of this and this and this and this and this, and it's a great company and it's a great company and it's a great company. I think the really valuable thing about your videos is that you do, you bring it back to, what you know what are the risks like what is the risk reward like that's always a, a big thing that you talk about and i think that's a lot of uh it's a it's kind of a an area that should be in a lot more videos that kind of gets a bit glossed over but i think it's definitely worthwhile um obviously if, for listeners out there checking out sven's videos and looking because there's he talks a lot about you know risk reward and i think that's like a major major thing that a lot of people miss 
if you read Seth Klarman's book, Margin of Safety of uh, Warren Buffett, uh, whatever he did, he, they first focus on risk because the important thing yeah. when it comes to investing it is that uh, you are there playing the game tomorrow. If you don't mm. focus on risks, sooner or later you're wiped out. And right. when you're wiped out, uh, it's gone, it's over. You cannot simply rebuild what you have. And therefore, I first start on risk. Okay, what can go wrong? If this goes wrong, if this goes wrong, if this goes wrong, what am I left yeah. with? And then you compare it only then to the upside. So for example, talking back to Tesla, I know there is a risk of 100 and even everybody knows it and even Elon Musk knows it. There is a risk that you lose 100% of your investment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, slower sales, uh, debt covenants, uh, lower rating ratios, less sales, bam, 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 Tesla is bankrupt. Some other company will buy, buy it out for uh, just the debt, which is about 30 billion. And that's it. And your stock goes to zero. And then you cannot play the game next next week. So I'm always looking yeah. for risk first compared to the rewards. And that's it because nobody knows what will happen. And that's very dangerous if you try to know what will happen. But you can estimate what can happen on the risk side and on the reward side and makes investing boring, but much easier. <laughs> yeah. I think an e a, a sort of a, a simple mistake that a lot of people fall into is if they find something that they like, like a Tesla, it's really easy to fall into a confirmation bias where you just don't look at the risk at all and you're all about the reward. How much, how many cars could they make? Could they make 10 million cars? Yeah, they could make 10 million cars, but you're right. You really need to start with the risk because that is the most important thing. What does Warren Buffett say? Don't lose money. Focus on what your downside is. And if there's limited downside and there's potential for quite a lot of upside, then it could make quite a good investment. Um, yeah. And I guess sort of the an, another part, important part of analysis is to talk about how much you're paying for those cash flows because you can't, those cash flows that a company is going to return to you is limited. It's not infinite um, and it doesn't change based on how much you pay. So there is a limited amount that you should be willing to pay for a company. Um, and I'm curious as to Sven, uh, how do you assess how much you're willing to pay? How do you calculate sort of how much cash you could conservatively get back from a company? And then what do you work out as to what price you're willing to pay for that? So uh, I think that the more you research, the more, the more stones you turn, the more, more opportunities you will find. So yeah. uh, also if somebody's only just starting with investing, I would say, okay, aim for a 5% return and you will find a lot of good companies that will deliver that 5% return. Uh, just yeah. look at the earnings, cash flows, distribution, dividend yield. I mean, Apple is now delivering a 6-7% return and will probably deliver it over the next 10 years because yeah. people are yeah. still going to buy iPhones and things like that. A little bit less, a little yeah. bit more, but the core of the business is not going anywhere. And if you yeah. buy Apple, you will get a seven, six, seven percent return, which is extremely, uh, an extremely good return for, let's say, 80 percent of the people. But if yeah. you fall yeah. into that 10 percent that wants more, more and more, you simply have to look for businesses that deliver earnings, cash flow yields, uh, dividends, buybacks that go 10% and higher than that. And for that, you have to look at a lot of businesses and then wait for them to be fairly priced. And yeah. you do that simply, I have a list of stocks that I watch and um, I don't know, one company that I'm just looking now, uh, I looked at it first time in 2015, it was $45. I estimated that the intrinsic value was about 60. I didn't buy because I said, okay, it can go up, it can go down. And uh, yep. last week I looked at it, it is at 25. Wow. Right, okay. Yep. And now it becomes very interesting for me. Okay, now you are there. Why are you there? Okay, what's going on? Did the business change? 
the business is actually just growing and now I have to mm. re-research everything and then I make a report on it and then I make a risk reward decision. I see, okay, what's the risk? What's the reward? Is it still worth 60 as I think over the long term it might be? And uh, you yeah. simply wait for the market to give you those opportunities and here and there you simply get them. A lot of stocks, everybody's waiting for a stock market crash, but last December, I think that a lot of stocks, even good stocks, fell more than 50% over the yeah. past six months. Yeah. And you just wait for those opportunities. If you know the intrinsic value of the business, you buy when that happens and that's it. And you can get 10, 15, 20% business returns. And uh, that's yeah. all what I do. That's all what I'm focused on. And that's practically the whole story. Yeah, so it's for you, it's more about you know, analyzing what the business itself can produce in terms of earnings and, you know, understanding the business and thinking about where they're going and what they're producing right now and what those earnings and cash flows might be in the future to yeah. kind of try and to try and estimate an intrinsic value now and aiming then to kind of, I guess, discounting that to try and make sure that the company offers you good risk reward and it offers you a decent return. Would that be a kind of a good summary or have I got that and wrong? Exactly or? that. And yeah. there is always a nice question is, okay, let's say the stock market closes down for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. Would I be a happy owner of that business without a stock quote? So the only thing that I'm getting are uh, let's say dividends or reinvestments of earnings and if yep. that hits a yes then okay whatever happens I'm happy as a business owner because we are investing in businesses and when you switch from stock market investing to business investing everything is much easier. I, I would agree with that would you agree with that more about the business uh, and I think like Warren Buffett He's always saying he tries to look at the stock price last. I think so many, especially new investors, to be honest, they get so caught up in just looking at the price and the price is going down, the price is going up, the price is going down. But I think it's a much better strategy, as we've kind of been discussing, to analyze the business and invest for the business as opposed to looking at businesses just like stocks that have a price that move up and down. Would you agree with that, Hamish? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Warren Buffett, he says so many great things. One of those things was what you just said, Sven, the would you be happy holding it if the stock market closed for 20 years? Another one is how he explains it. Just invest in it like it's a rental property, like you're buying the house. How much rent can you get back net of your expenses? And if interest rates are at 3%, is that return satisfactorily above that 3% return? And it, it's it's when you look into the businesses like that, um, it becomes a lot easier than trying to work out and trying to speculate where a stock price could move to, especially in the short term. Um, is uh, yeah, I just I think Warren Buffett's got a lot of wisdom, and um, it sounds like you 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 have sort of a lot of similar philosophies as to Warren Buffett and all these other great uh, value investors, Sven. Um, I, so I th in terms of what we're going to talk about next, I guess sort of we'll get into um, portfolio structure. So um, this is another thing that beginners and well anyone investing in the stock market can struggle with, and is is how should you structure your portfolio? Uh, should you have stocks and cash? Should you have stocks and bonds? Should you have different assets? Should you have gold? How do you sort of approach that, Sven? And what do you think is sort of the way to sort of build a portfolio? The biggest mistake that people make when building a portfolio is they, they think short term, like they watch stock prices yeah. go up and down on a daily basis and they, they, they think, okay, I have to structure my portfolio all right, uh, Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., I will structure my portfolio. You yep. build yep. a portfolio over 10, 20, 15 years, and that's mm. what people don't get. You simply say, okay, uh, first focus, how much am I going to invest per month, per year? And then you say, okay, what's now, what's cheap now? Three years yep. ago in the Netherlands, I could get a 30-year mortgage for 3% and the rent yield on the house that I bought was 7%. Oh, wow. Right. Wow, yeah. So, and that was the cheapest investment, the best investments I could find at that time. I didn't think about structuring portfolios. I simply said, okay, let's put all our money there now because that's a good investment. 
we are now yeah. we will now be selling the house we are about uh, 80 percent up on uh, the initial investment which was by the way leverage so the return on capital is i don't know uh, infinite uh, because in mm. the Netherlands you can get a 103% mortgage, no down payment necessary. <laughs> so, wow. so, and now, okay, three years have passed. Two years ago, 2016, there was a commodity crisis. Uh, I think Australia was hit hard in the beginning of 2016. Mm, yep. Yep. And all these commodity stocks were lying there, uh, some trading at below net cash per share. So, Forget about the mine, forget about the commodities, forget about everything. I'm paying $2 for something that has 2.5 in cash. Yeah. And yeah. so 2014, I was investing in real estate, 2016 in uh, commodities. The largest position was Nevson Resources that was acquired last year. Now I'm again looking, okay, what's cheap? And I try to build a portfolio over the long term so i have invested in real estate i will reinvest that money in other real estate or in stocks or whatever is cheap at that moment so i would not go in as structuring a portfolio okay it has to be like this or like that yeah, just okay. let the investments themselves structure your portfolio over the next decade and you avoid a lot of mistakes like i don't know buying bonds just because you have to have bonds or something like that yeah. I think I, I, I agree with you. I think that's a, lo a lot of the pressure that newcomers face is they kind of, especially in the stock mar market, they might have a little bit of cash and they've heard obviously the stories of, you know, obviously with stock market investing, it's, it's better the earlier you get in and they might feel a lot of pressure to take their savings and just try and get into the market. And sure, I mean, if you want to be a passive investor, you buy like a market tracking ETF and you just hold it, contribute to it for the rest of your life. That's great. But yeah, I agree with you that some sometimes, and I guess I see this a lot in the YouTube comments, sometimes it's worth just really thinking about what is short term and what is long term and, and how long are you going to be investing for? Because uh, for me personally, I, I know I'm going to be investing for my whole life and I've got a lot of, hopefully a, a lot of years left to live. So I think it is like what you're saying, less about, you know, I've got, uh, I've got $20,000 and I have to structure a portfolio today. I think that you're, uh, it's a very sound strategy what you're talking about. How it does, You don't have to go all in like first up, you know, look around and see where where the opportunities lie and you don't have to go, you don't have to jump in straight away, but maybe if there's, you know, a really cheap stock, you can start to build on that position. If there's like what you're saying, cheap real estate, then you can start to build on maybe a real estate portfolio and that sort of thing. But I don't think that people should feel, newcomers to the stock market, I don't think they should feel the pressure of having to get all of their money and just dump it somewhere that and cross their fingers and hope for a return. So it's just applying common sense, uh, checking, okay, what's the interest rate on my credit card debt yeah. that I have? Oh, it's 11%. Structure your portfolio by paying off your credit card debt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so just just common sense. Looking at what is the yield, what is the on the investment that you have, the student debt loan, on the rent you're paying. But should you buy something? Should you keep renting? And by applying common sense and thinking, okay, I will be building this portfolio of my wealth over the next fifty years. Then you say, okay, this year I will invest only in. I don't know, Tesla. If it works good, then next year the money I will invest in something else or something like that. So it really, people should take off the pressure of structuring something just because an investment bank says, or it sounds fancy to structure something. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that kind of, that's a good way to kind of wrap up what we're talking about about portfolio structure it's maybe not necessarily about feeling the pressure that you have to structure it um but yeah like what you're saying look at look at you know use your common sense and look at where your money's going you know is it worth paying down debt is it worth looking at are there some stocks that you really like that are looking cheap versus their cash flows and their earnings and that is their property and that sort of stuff so I think that was that's really good and you, you provided some really good insight into that area and um, I think that's a good time to kind of round it out and we'll just head into our last uh, section of the podcast which is of course our Q&A section. So we've got three questions here so I'm going to fire these at you. I'll fire the first one at you Sven. 
Um, I don't know. Have you have you heard of um, have you watched any of Phil Towns' videos on YouTube, Sven? Uh, just a few. Just a few. Yeah. Okay. Well, the first question here um, that's come in says Phil Towns says to use a company with a ten-year history of numbers. Um, but what if you find companies, say, with five years on the market that do seem to have good numbers? Are they worth researching or do you think I should just look at stocks that have a longer history of financials? What would you say about kind of history of financials and, and, and risk in that area, Sven? I think that, let's say, Phil Town is doing a good thing educating investors, but yeah. uh, what is uh, easy to sell is when you simplify everything. And that's what he is yeah, doing, true. trying to make everything simple. That's an easy sell that's appealing to a lot of stock market beginners, etc. But yeah. uh, what you care as an investor is not what happened in the last 10 years. It's what will happen in the next three, five, 10 years. So you're more about looking forward as opposed to understanding what they have been able to produce in the past or you weight them both equally? If we, if we go back to Kraft Heinz, 10 year numbers over the last 10 years look great and then last earnings came. But mm. if you would be focused on the numbers, you would have missed that consumer trends are changing. People are, uh, millennials especially, are less connected to brands. And then you see, okay, the trends are changing, the revenue, the, the earnings number, the dividend is good, the dividend is growing, the earnings were growing, but the revenue ha hasn't gone anywhere for the last six, seven years, anywhere right. flat, even if they did acquisition, etc. So I think yeah. it's important to, okay, you look at the numbers, but always try to go beyond the numbers, always trying to understand the story beyond the numbers. I was teaching yeah. accounting for three years and I always told my students, now I'm going to tell you something that you will not like. Accounting and the numbers won't tell you anything. You have to always <laughs> go beyond the number and understand, okay, what's the number beyond, what's the actual real thing beyond the number? Uh, I have seen businesses that uh, they bought something in 1970, a building, uh, amortize it over, uh, depreciated it over the last 40 years. So property plant and equipment is zero on the balance sheet, zero. Yeah. The value yeah. of the building on the market is $100 million. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah and so well. when somebody tells me, look at the numbers, no, I have to look at beyond the numbers because there is where I can find the advantage. So it's very dangerous to just look at the numbers without looking at the business. And yeah. even if there are just three years of numbers, we are in a world that changes fast. Uh, it's enough if you can understand what's going on with the business. Yeah, I think that's a really good answer. Uh, we'll just quickly get into the second one. So the second question we got here from a viewer was, uh, what are some personal finance and investing tips that you could give my 16 year old son? So he has a part time job, they added. So what are some personal finance and investing tips for someone who's say in their teens? Uh, I would say start investing no matter what happens, because now you have little money. And if you lose everything, you will lose little money. The biggest mistake people are doing, they wait to be 30, 35, get the first real good paycheck, get the first real good bonus, and then they start investing. And then they yeah. do the beginner's mistakes. They invest in a high market, in a hot stocks. Don't get yeah. me started on uh, weed stocks, bitcoins, <laughs> and things like that. And then they lose a lot of money. Why there is nobody talking about Bitcoin now because 90% of people lost money on that. Yeah. And yeah. so I would say start investing now just as an educational experience. Start understanding the businesses, the cash flows, what happened, uh, go back and be give yourself a commitment that you will invest, I don't know, 20, 50, 100 bucks per month. 
doesn't matter what happens, just see, see it as an educational uh, perspective and it will, the difference will be measured in millions over your lifetime yeah. because you will be 30, you will have more money, your wife will say, oh, we should invest in this apartment on this luxurious boat to travel across <laughs> the world in a timeshare. And you will say, I love you, my darling, but let's invest somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and it will save you it will save you millions so uh, that's it just focus on building experience and that's it yeah i think that's what i would say as well build experience and try and get into investing when you don't have much to lose especially 16 year old i mean you've got obviously this is written in by um by the either mother or father so it's just like you you know you've got that that backing of your parents, you know, you know, if, if things go wrong, you're still going to be okay. So take that opportunity to not be, not be silly about things, but to have those educational experiences. So I and, think exactly and what you're saying. The most important thing is to structure that education. Okay. Now you want to invest, let's say in cryptocurrencies. What is your strategy when it comes to that? What happens if yep. cryptocurrencies fall around another 50%? Why did they fall? What's the value? And mm. when you start understanding yep. the background of that, simply your investing life that will last another probably 70, 80 years, the way healthcare is going, will be much, much easier. So it's just about education when it comes to anybody below yeah. 70. That's everybody still young below 70. Yeah, <laughs> very true. Um, and the last question that I had for you, Sven, uh, the last question we've got for today is from your experience, are there any must read books that you've encountered um, that you would recommend to maybe new investors or even more experienced investors? Uh, what are some books or some resources that have really helped you kind of throughout your journey? If I would say you have to read uh, One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch and mm. read it 10 times. Yeah. 10 times over. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Next. 10 weeks, read it 10 times yep. over. And that's it because it's so simple. It's so well, so focused on really the core when it comes to investing, uh, yep. mistakes, making mistakes. Uh, he says simply, if I'm right four out of 10 times, I'll make a lot of money. Mm. So yeah. people have to accept failure, accept losing money, accept how the, learn how the investing game works and he explains it so perfectly well in the book that i would say that that's that's the book you should read he's a little bit more uh, let's say aggressive than buffett but that's okay i think for most of the population yeah i, I just yeah. ordered that book actually it uh it came just a couple of weeks ago so i've got a I need, oh, I need nice. to get into that. What your book Sven, you can feel free to plug your own book as well i'm sure it's a great book where is it modern value investing is that modern value investing it's available on uh, amazon so uh, it's right, really okay. i tried to uh, because the last value investing books were written i don't know the intelligent investor in 1972 oh, so long ago uh, yeah. margin of safety from seth Klarman uh, in 1991 and the, yep. the modern books were more about uh, okay let me find an easy formula that i can sell like greenblatt yep. or something like that so i decided yep. okay let's summarize the core value investing messages from the past and then apply also everything that changed over the last 50 years from behavioral finance that came in uh, from George Soros from a little bit of daily or uh, gold investing and things like that and try to yep. give a message try to educate people and then I also went and uh, gave uh, 25 tools that go from management from accounting from uh, earnings from intrinsic values and everything to really for those that really want to dig into the research part how to invest in uh, stocks so that's that was my message with the book. It's doing well on Amazon. Uh, I think um, the ebook is selling like Peter Lynch, one up on Wall Street. So we are on the same uh, Amazon uh, best selling oh, list. Nice. So I'm proud of fantastic. that. Fantastic. Five stars yeah. reviews. So very, very uh, good feedback so yeah well m yeah make sure you guys make sure you go check that out i mean it sounds like it's uh, i'm gonna have to order myself a copy because it sounds like it's an absolutely fantastic resource um so yeah we'll make sure that that link is uh left in the description of the youtube video 
um, when we put it up. Um, so yeah, check that out. And and where else can people find you online? You're running a YouTube channel. Where can they find you? So if you just type uh, "invest with Sven Kerlin" on uh, YouTube, or you can find I have a website. I'm now also what I write, what I do on YouTube. I try to write on articles. So if you go to yeah. SvenKarlin.com, there is my blog and all the other resources. Uh, that I have. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, that kind of brings us to the end of the podcast. Um, Huge thank you to you, Sven, for coming on and and having a chat to us. Thank you guys for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, that's okay. And uh, yeah, thanks for giving up. What is it? Is it your Friday night? Is that right? Yeah, Friday night now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I'm sure like the listeners got an absolute, they would have gotten an absolute ton of value. I know I certainly got a ton of value um, out of being able to have a chat. So thank you very much for coming on. Thank you guys for having me. That's all right. Thanks, Hamish, for coming on and and talking all things stocks as per usual. And uh, make sure, guys, if you have any Q&A questions for the next podcast, uh, leave them down in the YouTube comments section uh, down below. And make sure you go over and subscribe to to Sven on YouTube as well. He's got some, just as we were saying before, some absolutely amazing, um, very well-researched stock market uh, videos. So make sure you check that out. But thanks, guys. Thanks very much for listening, as always. And uh, that brings us to the end. So we'll see you guys in the next episode. See you later, guys. Thank you.